Hi, I'm Jason Belk, and I am a senior technical advocate in the Learning Certifications Group at Cisco. Today, I'm going to talk about my best practices, the things I've learned while I've been on the job in network operations and then consulting. The presentation overall is called It Sounded Good on Paper, How to Avoid Common Pitfalls in Network Automation. This presentation is really born out of the, those experiences I had when I was in Cisco IT. So I was in Cisco IT operations in the Campus and Branch team for several years. Then I helped lead their automation there as well. And then after leaving Cisco, I went to network to co which is a small training consulting um, company focusing on network automation. And I saw lots of different enterprises, lots of different companies all, all over the, that were experiencing the same problems that I saw myself when I was trying to do it within our own operations team. So these different points, the things I'm gonna talk about are basically born out of those experiences and lessons learned that I wanna share with you, the listener. I'm gonna break it up into two parts. The first part is how to fail. Pitfalls to avoid when getting started. And the second part is how to su succeed. Tips and tricks from experience. And just as a little disclaimer, I had taken some of this content with permission from Kirk Byers. He had done a presentation a few years back on Nanog that I found really helpful and I wanted to build upon his good work. So now getting started, how to fail, pitfalls to avoid when getting started. The first one, don't start with high risk and difficult problems. So it's easy when you first get started in network automation, you get excited about the potential. You get excited about all the possible things that you can do with these new tools, the architectures you've seen, the promises of, and the demos, seeing network automation go end to end, solving lots of different problems. But I wanna encourage you, person who is getting started in the network automation journey, whether you're an individual contributor, you're a manager, you're a team lead, just make sure and build up that momentum within your team. You want to have people feel like what you're accomplishing is actually trustworthy and going to make an impact in the long run. And also, if you start with a high risk and difficult problem, you're if you, <laughs> by nature of it, have a high risk and difficult problem and fail, then it's going to really hinder your efforts to have that adoption within the entire organization. So the example I want to give from my experience is that my first major project as a network automation person when I was first getting started just relearning Python myself as a network engineer was iOS software upgrades which if you've worked with them before hands-on in the operations team you know it's no joke I mean that there's a lot of different dependencies you have to worry about so it's a high risk difficult problem when you have dependencies on hardware differences between dual supervisor and single supervisor devices you have complex business processes is when you're upgrading these devices you don't want to have any outages and possibly if you reload the box and something goes wrong it might not come back up as well as other issues possibly you have sites in our case we have all over the world with different latency issues when you're transferring these large installation files to upgrade the software on these different network devices you could have huge variation between you know, upgrading a device within your local campus versus a branch office that might be thousands of miles away and so you, you have lots of dependencies and then you also have failure at multiple layers. Just as an example, you, you could have a failure on the device itself when you're upgrading a software. You could have the hardware fail, you could have a software bug, you could even just have code bugs within your automation that's deploying all of these different components. So all that to say is, is that when you're starting with your network automation, you wanna focus on lower risk, simpler problems that are still gonna impact the business in a positive way. So that there's different ways to approach that. We'll cover in some of the other topics, but just to talk to that point here, as, as we're talking about it, is, is to say you wanna focus on things that are read only, things that are not going to Im impact your production bottom line. And, and also, you know, of course, you wanna start with your labs first and start possibly with virtual devices or a physical lab to be able to prove that your automation is working and, and not necessarily say, hey, we're gonna do this huge project that's gonna you know, fix everything all at once. So you don't wanna start with high risk, difficult problems. You want to start with you know a confined scope of what you're trying to accomplish build that trust build that confidence within your team as you're able to move down your automation journey now let's talk about the next point don't assume an all or nothing mindset so the example i have from my experience for this one is we had an effort that took several years of adoption and planning and getting all the teams on board for a single source of truth golden config project. So we wanted to have all of our configurations across all of our places in the network, campus, branch, 
Backbone Core and then possibly even Data Center all saying basically we want to have all of our configuration standardized and not have any variations, which is a great goal, something you want to have in your network. But realistically, you know, you're each of those different places in the network, whether that's the campus team versus the branch team versus the Backbone Core team versus the Data Center team, each of them, even within those places in the network, have different diverse priorities. They have exceptions that they need to figure out. And in our case, the negotiation and trying to figure out exactly what that golden config should be became a problem that there was, in our case, an unclear scope and a scope creep where we kept adding on more and more features, trying to figure out exactly what we wanted. And the definition of done of what we were trying to accomplish was just too ambitious. It, it was not clear. So rather than like the previous one, talking about don't start with high risk difficult problems, if you assume an all or nothing, nothing mindset like this one is talking about, you're gonna run into issues of we need to automate everything or we might as well do nothing. Well, it's not, there's somewhere in between where you're able to maybe clarify the scope, say, okay, we're gonna focus just on our campus devices on the west coast of the US, or we're gonna focus on our branch devices in Western Europe or other parts of the world. And once you accomplish that, then move out to the next component, move out to the next one, building up that momentum, building up that trust within your organization. Because if you have that all or nothing mindset, it's gonna make it difficult when the inevitable issues come up of trying to negotiate exactly what your automation solution is supposed to do. And if you're trying to boil the whole ocean at once, it's gonna make it very difficult to really build up that momentum and actually accomplish anything before it's too late. Next, let's talk about don't fail to learn good debugging processes. Now for this one, it's really important to think about debugging has multiple different components. You could be debugging your automated software, your Python script, your Ansible playbook, whatever you're working with, Go, Java, JavaScript. So debugging is at several different layers. You, you need to be able to debug, of course, the network device itself. If there's any particular issues with the automation, the points of configuration, the network isn't performing correctly, yes, you need to be able to understand that debugging. But Really what I'm talking about here is you wanna learn the good debugging processes in your software development life cycle. And if, if you're not able to establish those good debugging processes early on, it's gonna be harder down the road to be able to establish that within your team. Debugging is something that you can't learn just overnight and it takes some practice getting used to, but getting that ball rolling as quickly as possible. Um, an example for me is when we were doing that iOS upgrade process, we were having issues where our test runs against the lab devices that we were just trying to figure out the code we were not working. We, we were not having any results in our print statements. We were just doing print statements at the time, but we started doing logging. Um, and, and basically the issue was, in this particular instance, the NetMiko, the Python li library we were using to talk to the network devices, was timing out. And we didn't realize that because we weren't having the proper logging in place to be able to see all the interactions happening between the network device and our, in our Python code. And what we eventually started to figure out was that if the software was not being transferred and fully transferred, it would just remove everything and not have a partial transfer. And if it, we weren't able to see that unless we were able to capture the output while it was in process, not just at the end, you know, getting some type of verification because we needed to see live in, in real time exactly what was going on with these network devices. Um, and. It, Another good debugging process is to try the process manually first. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people try to automate something that they actually haven't tried to do without doing it on the automated side, or they haven't done it recently, or they haven't tried it on the particular infrastructure that they're trying to automate. Um, and sometimes it's just simple as a simple syntax issue that's different from one platform to the next. You didn't realize it, or maybe there's a you know character encoding issue. There's lots of different things that can just pop up that if you didn't try to do it manually, you wouldn't see those issues pop up. So learning good Python debugging processes, you know, enable logging when, when you're working, um, create, creating your Ansible or Python scripts, you know, increase your timeouts and verbosity. So, cause oftentimes you have default timeouts when you're talking to these network devices. And then those timeouts, in, if you're working in a production environment, can actually vary quite a bit. If, if you're talking just to your lab device on the other side of the room, you don't have to worry about that timeout very much, but maybe you're talking to a network device across the world that has a lot of traffic going through and, and CPU is getting high and so everything's a little bit slower and then suddenly your, your scripts are failing. Now being able to capture all of that in your logging is really important. So you wanna make sure to learn those good debugging processes. And one final one that I think especially is helpful when you're 
Ansible is to isolate your execution one step at a time. So rather than trying to do all of your tasks at once in an Ansible playbook, or if you have several different steps in your workflow, being able to comment out the code and just focus on one particular component and be able to execute that code one step at a time, see the output, make sure that's working, and then add the next one, add the next one from there. So now, the next one. We have don't superficially copy code without comprehension. So this is something that I wanna have a caveat on, is that yes, I know when we're all getting started, we wanna copy examples, we wanna have that code just to see it run, see it work on our networks. But superficially copying code time and time again, month after month, year after year, you're actually cheating yourself. <laughs> You're not learning how things work. You're not learning the process of building something. Um, and if, if you're just taking someone's entire project, dumping it, and then it works, that's great. But then what happens when it breaks? What happens when you leave the organization, someone else has to try to fix it, and you didn't have any documentation because you, you were having trouble just making it work yourself. So the example I have is that there was an engineer who built a web app for our organization. And I looked at the code and I was like, wow, this is way beyond what I thought you, what I'd seen him do in other projects. And when I looked at the code, there were actually comments and issues in the code that were kind of weird. And so I copied and pasted the code into a web browser and saw that it actually was straight from Stack Overflow. We literally just <laughs> copied and pasted all the Stack Overflow into his own project. It shortchanges you in the long run that you're not able to grow as an engineer. You want to be able to use code initially to kind of get, jumpstart you, get you started, build up that confidence. Um, but after a while, you want to be able to understand how your code works and then how you can improve it. And then being able to troubleshoot and explain the code to others doesn't really happen unless you're able to build it yourself. So now don't forget to document your work. So this is really, really important. I know it sounds kind of silly. Of course, I'm going to document my work, but realistically, I think we all get busy. We all move on to the next project because that's where the, the, the new attention to management has come. And if, if you don't take the time to write down not not just what your code is trying to do, but the steps of, you know, what Linux distribution did you have it running on, what packages were installed, Python, you know, ans Ansible versions, wh whatever you're working with, being, so people can reproduce your code as much as possible. You know, maybe that means providing a Docker file or a Vagrant file, providing a, some type of virtual environment for people to be able to reproduce your code as easily as possible without having to second guess exactly what's going on. Uh, so the example I have here is that when I was in the consulting side for a little bit, I was brought into an organization that had Ansible, but the version of Ansible that they had was actually so far customized from the original that I couldn't even just give them the Ansible documentation to teach them how to use it. I really had to take weeks of my own time to go through all of their code and then reverse engineer uh, examples for them to learn how to use their own, in their own distribution of Ansible because uh, they had so many different customizations and things that were adding value to their organization, but the frontline engineers were different than the engineers who were maintaining the code base. And the frontline engineers were struggling to be able to troubleshoot and get and create their own playbooks within this customized Ansible distribution. And so in that case, they actually had to pay consultants myself to come in to be able to explain their own code to them. And you don't want to <laughs> get to a point where you're having to pay people to create your own documentation. Ideally, what you want to do is do it along the way and also just in terms of future proofing your own job, the more that you can document your own code and your own explanation helps you in the future remember what you were doing because after all, I know I forget things, but it also helps reduce the number of times someone else has to come up to you and ask simple questions that otherwise you could just point them to the doc documentation and they could self-service and be able to figure out things all on their own. Mm -hmm.